Hello everyone, welcome to the People's Health Dispatch video interview. Recently, the UK Home Office has come under severe criticism by human rights and health activists for its plan to deport asylum seekers from UK to Rwanda. Former Home Secretary Preeti Patel's plans have caused alarm and have been quoted to breach basic human rights and international law. In addition to widespread mobilization against the removals, the policy led to actions by many professional groups including physicians. In this episode of People's Health Dispatch, we are meeting with Liana Reynolds and Sipida Saleh, co-signatories of an appeal sent to Patel by more than 400 doctors in the UK. Uh, welcome, uh, Liana and Sipida. Hello. To begin with, could you tell us a bit more about the context in which this policy was shaped and what did it set out to achieve actually as the government? This is a... Um... A fantastic but a slightly complicated question for someone who is really just a haematology trainee with a conscience. Um, there is so much interplay with history and economics, climate change, global politics and local politics that all have created the perfect storm for this situation really. But the concept of seeking asylum isn't new. Where there are wars and natural disasters, if there's desperation then people are going to take their future in their hands and migrate and seek refuge somewhere new. And historically, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, and then later the Geneva Convention, so 1951, formalized the responsibility of neighboring countries and countries all around the world to recognize the rights of people who are in that des desperate situation and who are seeking asylum. And the real question I think is, if it's been going on for such a long time, why is it a problem now? Why is now when people are getting so up in arms about it? And sadly, um, between global economics being not so great at the moment, um, a large number of wars, um, climate change and the effects that's having with natural disasters, famine, drought, there is an increase in people seeking asylum. Um, including people seeking asylum in the UK, but actually worldwide. Uh, 89 million people were forcibly displaced over the last year, um, with 53 million um, being internally displaced. 27 million are people who already have asylum um, status, so who, are, who already are refugees, and 4.6 million are people who are seeking asylum. So when you look at the, the big numbers, um, actually, it's a very small number of people who are seeking asylum, but massive numbers of people are being displaced, including internally displaced. And it is it's a major problem. So why are people coming to the UK? Well, although it's a smaller proportion of people, um, the UK is, is considered a, an attractive place to go to because it's perceived as being safe. Um, it's perceived as being a peaceful place and the UK has uh, fostered, it has created influence over other countries over generations and that's via the media. I think um, Mr Bean and Friends has been played on every ferry or plane I've been on ever. Um, it's education, it's the language and um, to be frank about it, we colonise lots of the world. So England has had a major um, part in the history of large proportions of the world. And that's something that we have to own. It is our history. Um, and because of that influence being broadcast globally for generations, people see the UK as a place that would be good to restart their life. And I think we probably want people to think that UK is a good place to be. So kind of fits. But where did this policy of actually, you know, sending back, uh, you know, people, citizens, uh, you, know, you know, citizens uh, is a different thing. But, you know, they are sending back someone who is in the UK right now, uh, these asylum seekers. So how do, I mean, what's the root of this uh, policy or, you know, this act of sending back? And we, we also see this comes with a lot of nationalism with a lot of you know, right-wing kind of understanding also sometimes and uh, in the name of actually saving money, austerity, 
doing good to the citizens by pointing out at someone who has come from Uganda uh, as the main problem. Uh, Sipita, would you like to say something in uh, addition to what Ian has been saying? Um, so yes, I think there's many aspects to this, of course. We have, um, we have what started with, uh, well, started long before it, but Theresa May had a policy. Um, this billboard that that proclaimed "Go home" everywhere, and and there were a number of policies around that time, high-profile policies, um, which really aimed to make it difficult for people who are seeking asylum in the UK, make life more difficult. And around that, there was a, a wider system of so-called hostile environment through the legal systems, etc. And this can really worsen, I think, the trauma for people who are essentially just seeking seeking a safe place to live um in addition in this country it tends to cost so much more in terms of benefits and legal fees and just prevents people from getting what they need in a country which is just a safe fresh start i think and and then a chance next to start contributing to the economy and working as as humans like we all do here um so there's this kind of deterrent policy that started many years ago but was also brought up again by Theresa May um, however I think it's really important to recognize that people before they enter the UK they don't know about this they have no idea and traveling here they're just coming to what they perceive to be like Liana says a place of safety um, so it's it's very very unlikely to be working as any sort of deterrent for people who are just trying to come over and start a new life essentially um, I, don't, I think I'll go on. Sorry, sorry I was going to say I don't think it's aimed at them either. I don't think it's aimed at the people that are on their way here. I think it's it's a it's a very um, cunning play after after an economic downturn in the UK where British citizen uh, quality of life has decreased, and instead of saying the problem is this, that, and the other, they've sort of pointed the problem is them. So the hostile environment is not really aimed to stop people coming to the UK because they don't, people don't know. If you are in, in a camp in Calais, you do not know that there is someone going around with a billboard in London telling people to go home. How could you? So it's aimed for um, appeasing a group of people in the UK. And let's be frank about it. It's a group of people in the UK who are fundamentally brought up in a in a racist system um, we have a country which was built around the idea that, that white people deserve a better life than everyone else that's what came up initially that's where we started and and although people are working hard to get away from that and there's less and less in um frank open society that is the foundation that the uk is built on um, and it gets people's backs up and people don't like it. And it's not always conscious. People may not realize they do it, but it's there. And we have to recognize it in order to move forward. And that, that benefit system that was put in place to support people who are struggling is for everybody, but is perceived by white British people to be for white British people. And that, that is part of the problem. Yeah. So yeah, a bit of misdirection. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's uh, to an extent diverting the uh, uh, you know whole situation from uh, you know crony capitalism and the economic downturn towards showing that a few asylum seekers are the reason for uh, the present situation in the UK. But you know, and also it has its roots, of course, in xenophobia and racism to an extent. And I think we do know the colonial past also uh, adds to this. You know, but uh, coming to the camping, in your letter that you have sent to the Home Secretary, you have listed out a set of reasons that provoked you as health workers <coughs> to react to the uh, to whatever has been happening. Can you please walk us through some of those, maybe uh, both uh, Liana and then Sipida? Um, I have to say on this one, I sort of started the letter, um, but uh, I've I wasn't the person that gave it form. So I am. Uh, uh, I um, developed an, an interest in um, 
in helping friends. I have friends who are seeking asylum who I was supporting um, in the in the area where I live. Um, and through that, I have seen how ridiculous the policies are and how ridiculously difficult it is for people who just want to get on with their lives to contribute and start afresh to do that because of the barriers that are put in place by the Home Office. Um, and it, they are massive barriers. Um, there's, it's made very difficult to, to get education. It's been made very difficult to contribute in any meaningful way. And you have um, massive uncertainty, relocation around the country at regular interview, intervals. People don't get a chance to make friends. So just being a friend and knowing people may, means that this is important to me. And then I saw this policy come into place. And I think the, the real backdrop to the policy, one of the main things was the, the 2015 um, uh, Alan Kurdi, a, a two-year-old boy from Syria, was found on a beach in Turkey. And there was this big outcry of boats are sinking, people are dying, this must stop. And that came from a good place, I think. Um, but the government at the time took a whole bunch of people who were sympathetically saying boats must stop, this is, this is not right, and a whole bunch of people who are, um, for other reasons, saying the boats must stop, people can't be having our benefits, our system, money is limited, we need it for our own, and it combined this together into the policy of we need to not have um, people migrating to the UK, to the, to the UK um, including not having refugees. So that's that's sort of where that policy's backdrop is. And when this policy came through and I saw the information that it was having that it was going to cause and the terror it's causing people, I just thought this is not this is not right. We can't do this. This is not what my this is what, what, what my country should be doing. Um, and I saw a letter from a group of professionals in media that was a, a professional's letter about the Rwanda policy appealing not to not to do it and I thought well I'm a professional and there are professional reasons not to do this there are very good medical reasons not to do this we should write a letter so I put a, a post on a Facebook group with um, oh I don't know how many doctors are on that group now quite a few but they're all medical and they're all mums um, and said shall we write a letter can someone help and then Sapida, thank goodness answered and provided content which is exactly what I was struggling with so I'm probably better to hand over to Sapida when it comes to the actual content of it thank you Sapida. thank you so much Liana um and thank you for explaining so much about the background and where you're coming from. And I'd like to say uh, the content, I think, was very much there. Um, I came from a slightly different perspective um, where I I had done research with asylum seekers in the past and kind of made friends and things as well, of course, from that setting. So um, having insights, having done interviews and, and written about um people who are in this situation again as you say it became so clear um how these asylum seekers just are a group of people who firstly they may well be medically and psychologically vulnerable but this is because they've been so resilient to what we see as often extreme hardship before migration so what we we call the pre-migration and migration histories so so many I mean, people like you and me but who had before migrating and throughout their migration, which is often complex um, and dangerous, have faced a lot of hardships. Um, so I'd say taking this and take taking the um, our both of our, our both our social research and our medical backgrounds, we kind of try to set out some of the reasons, as you say, um, for being against this as as medical people being against this policy so um talking about we just to know now i'm using the word forced location or forced relocation rather than deportation which is often used because 
Um, the people that we're talking about here, they've not had their cases heard or denied. So that, is, that would have been the definition of deportation. So the, the policy of relocating people to Rwanda really is a forced relocation. Um, so this forced relocation to Rwanda that they were talking about with, as it is, no clear plan for health care, for maternity care, for any kind of psychiatric or psychological support that people need. We would have said it's it's unethical, clearly unethical, to say the least. And it's not something that most medical professionals and certainly the large number of people signing the letter would accept for any of the people under their care, any of our patients. Um, so to talk through a couple of just clear examples of this, one particular example is um, a medical issue like malaria. So in the UK, our guidance for all travellers and anyone, any citizen states that the malaria risk in Rwanda is high throughout the year in all areas of Rwanda, and it recommends prophylaxis, malaria prophylaxis for all travellers. Um, but for these asylum seekers being forcibly sent to Rwanda, there's no plan for any sort of prophylaxis, and that's clearly putting them in a, in a position of danger. Another example of just immediate harms that we see from this policy um, is that of LGBTQI plus people. So gay and lesbian people, trans people seeking asylum in the UK um, due to immediate dangers in their home countries. So again, I've met a lot of these people doing research, a lot of asylum seekers, and heard really harrowing accounts of the oppression that they're having physical violence often um, from these people who were brave enough to have made it over here to seek safety. Um, and in Rwanda, there's a clear record of risks to this group of people. So there's been regular detention, there's been harassment and physical violence against gay and transgender people. Um, this has been reported by organisations like Human Rights Watch and even in a Home Office report in the UK. So there are, in fact, even gay Rwandan people seeking asylum in the UK for this, this reason. So the removal of these vulnerable people to a place of what will be essentially a great danger is absolutely unthinkable to medics and other health professionals, as well as, I'm sure, to the general public. Um, and then finally, just to talk a little bit about the wider repercussions of this policy um, and how they'd affect generally people around the country. So again, in my work with asylum seekers, and I'm sure Liana has experienced very similar with her contacts and friends. It's so clear how this fear of forced relocation to unimaginable and dangerous circumstances suddenly becomes this overwhelming force in individuals' lives. So they're essentially trying to protect their safety and protect the safety of their children. And a large number of asylum seekers will therefore avoid contact with, contact with any services, including services to which they are legally, they have a legal right. So, so many people then avoid, end up avoiding seeking healthcare for acute um, conditions, chronic conditions, avoid seeking maternity care in pregnancy and so on. And then at times this can create such bigger and actually much more expensive in the long-term problems um, in the UK, just later along the line. And then in addition, this, there's a huge, huge mental burden of living under these circumstances that you, you hear so often speaking to asylum seekers. And this is all just unconscionable, I think, for health professionals in this country. Um, you know, it's quite inhuman about how uh, you're actually putting back a person in the same circumstances that they came here, you know, tried to leave or have left and come here. And then uh, instead of being helpful to the uh, asylum seeker who has come, leaving all this trauma behind, you're actually also having a chilling effect where uh, it, it looks like, from what I understand, that the health service, I mean, the health services and the social services there, instead of being uh, receiving and showing warmth, are actually giving a chilling effect by scaring them away from using or uh, reaching out to any of these services. You know, I, I think in the past also we have heard many campaigns uh, uh, in, in, in similar, uh, by health professionals in UK, which will come to at a later uh, thing. But, you know, you, you have written a letter to the uh, uh, Home Secretary's office and, uh, you know, what is the present situation of this policy? What is the status of the policy as we meet today? How many people have been uh, impacted by this policy? 
and are there any plans uh, to take forward building of alternative discourse is there much more activism is there much more resistance to what is happening and what is the kind of reaction from uh, uh, both the health and medical fraternity but also beyond uh, generally politically in the uk I think it's worth saying that the health um, the healthcare community is slightly atypical in the UK because we are a diverse group um, and we choose to work in the NHS, which generally means that we're used to a bit of suffering for the sake of the greater good. Because um, let's face it, it's not what people would opt for if they realised. Um, so I think I think amongst healthcare workers. Um, you, you see a lot more sympathy when it comes to this kind of thing. Um, and that's, that's a positive thing um, to take forward. But I also think as healthcare workers, we see more of the consequences. Just like Sir Peter said, when people come in with a complication of pregnancy, if they haven't seen anyone all the way through, that's, that's us there dealing with that. And you compare that to, um, recently we had a group of, refugees coming from Afghanistan who were um, granted asylum before they came into the country and the process by which they were seen by medical personnel and everyone who needed medical input were put into the local systems immediately and we saw some children come through the pediatric hematology department who went straight on to prophylaxis for their their conditions and went on to be living normal lives, contributing and paying taxes and doing all the things that the family that we want people to do in the UK. And that, that's the system that works for everyone. It's cheaper for the UK taxpayer, it's better for people who are going through it. Surely that is what we're looking for. And the direction that policy is taking us at the moment is completely opposite to that. And that's, that's what needs to change. And there are some organisations taking the Home Office to court about the policy um, and no one yet has been forcibly relocated to Rwanda, thank goodness, but there are still people being issued with letters. There are still people who are right now in detention centres fearing being deported at short notice or being relocated at short notice. Um, and the effect of that is, is massive on those individuals. Um, and while people are being harmed by it, we can't just sit back and let it happen. Um, so it's, a, it's something that people are getting involved with and, and people are trying to change. Um, but it's individual people. Um, that's, that's how all the groups start. That's where it comes from. It's, it's one person going onto a Facebook group and saying, hey, let's do something about this. And then it's that other person saying, yeah, hey, yeah, let's do that. Let's just do something. So as medical professionals, there is MedAct, um, uh, which we can get involved with and are very good. They're doing a campaign called Patients Not Passports, um, which is a very important campaign. There are the groups such as Detention Aid, um, Care for Calais, uh, who are um, taking the Home Office to court over the policy, and I recommend following those groups and contributing to those groups. I hear lawyers are expensive. So if anyone can financially help, that is useful. Protesting, I know that's harder at the moment, but we can protest much more safely than people seeking asylum can. So it's, it's a good thing to do. Write to your local newspaper, raise a discussion with people you meet, write to your MP, consider policies when you vote, particularly policies about immigration and about how we treat those that are vulnerable in society. Um, challenge prejudice at all times. Every time you see it, it's hard. No one likes to argue with their nan, but challenge it anyway. Um, and challenge it within yourself. Question yourself when you look around a room and you're standing in a group of white people and there's a group of other people over there that you didn't go and stand with. And why did you do that? And move around. Um, and if you want to, you can sign our letter. We've got one. We'll keep sending it. But um, I think it's the other things that matter more. Thanks, Leah. So, Peter. Thank you. Um, I think Liana has talked a lot about the, the whole range of, of things and actions, and, and it really is 
a kind of ecosystem that makes these things work from the people lying on the street in London and stopping the vans going out to the lawyers doing pro bono work and everyone else. Um, I think it's really important to say. Um, something I think we were just mentioning earlier is the kind of wider environment. There, there are things, as Liana mentioned, about the political environment and how our, our voting and also our discussion can change that, can kind of shift the Overton window, really, of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. At times, I think, in this country, it seems like things have shifted so far to a place you know, to a place where cruelty and exclusion seems almost more okay, and maybe bringing things, bringing discussions up. Uh, we talked earlier about um, histories of colonialism and their issues of climate colonialism, which really are bringing up a lot more um, displacement and migration. And unfortunately, I think we'll see a lot more of that in the future. So I think bringing those up for discussion and, and making sure that um, that everything is is up for critique is also another way of, of contributing, I guess. I mean, it's great to know, but that nobody has been forcefully uh, relocated until now. And that, let, uh, you know, to an extent, we might say is a small success of various groups that have been uh, putting up some sort of resistance to this. You know, and also it's quite uh, uh, positive to see when you say that, you know, as NHS workers, you are actually or as medical students and workers in different uh, in the medical sector, end of the day you're also workers, and this sort of interlinkages of solidarity. It's not like you're taking over the cause of someone else, but providing that solidarity. And how important is actually this, uh, you know, necessity to uh, work across uh, various groups? I mean, how do you think? Uh, I mean, I, I, in, in more importantly, like when you reach out to 400 doctors or so on, like how do you get this through to fellow doctors? Sometimes it also might look like, you know, our medical doctors and so on, very apolitical. But on the other side, we see that both, uh, it, it, there's a huge push on decolonizing health and medical care and uh, uh, recognizing the fact that race and xenophobia and these all are systemic issues that we need to deal with as medical professionals so how should you know how what is the kind of discussions or debates or uh, you know activities that happen among fellow uh, medical uh, doctors and so on i mean jointly connecting these 400 but also generally also how does this uh, happen um i would say that in my experience, in my experiences, both in medicine and public health and in research and just in the wider world, um, there's such a variety of people and there are such a variety of ways to get through to people. I think going full on climate colonialism with everyone isn't going to get through. Um, so there are people for which just discussing about the humanity and those elements and, and the fact that essentially we all could be in that position and it could be all our children might make more headway. Um, there are people for whom legal discussions will make more sense and, and will get further. So the human rights then, discourse in general. Absolutely. And then I think that there is definitely a space for interrogating where this all came from. Um, and to think a bit more about our histories and, and how we're implicated in this country, um, but possibly not for everyone and not for everyone at this moment. But the world's a big place with a lot of people in it. <laughs> Thanks. I think it's all about meeting people and getting to know people. I think it's, it's much easier to hate them over there than hate Kenny, who lives with me, through that painting and is a beautifully wonderful lady. I, once you get to know somebody and, and hear a story and see what they're like, you realize there's, there's no malice here. There's only potential and there's no point in squashing that. Thanks a lot, Yana. I think in the people's health moment, we often keep saying that the struggle for health is the struggle for a more caring world. And I hope that uh, on this note, uh, really, uh, uh, you know, all the best for your future uh, struggles. And we hope that 
uh, struggles like these or uh, initiatives like these uh, will not be necessary. I don't mean, uh, uh, you know, we, we have a systemic answer to some of these uh, right from, you know, uh, the root causes for forced migration uh, to the necessity that where governments uh, actually welcome uh, asylum seekers and, you know, do not act in the way that they are doing right now. And I hope that we go towards, you know, a world without racism and xenophobia where this also take the root in. Uh, and all the best for your uh, future struggles and hope that you keep organizing both medical students, medical doctors, and of course, the, you know, we, we also, I think as doctors, uh, there is a certain uh, hierarchy, but uh, the, the need to have a larger uh, discourse, nurses and the sanitary staff and everyone together. And I think this is a definitely a step in the right direction. Uh, congratulations on that. And thank you so much for joining the People's Health Dispatch. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you.